feel like we need like a gong or something to officially start so that we can segue from like uh, witty, witty banter that we have right now to like really doing it for real. <laughs> can you, Tim, can you make that happen? Can you get a gong for next time? I don't have a gong, but uh, I will be happy to start the show. So. All right. Yeah, I think let's get it started. All right, let's do that. Okay, hey, welcome everybody to the Art of Ed uh, podcast, AOE Live. This is our first official episode. We are recording on Tuesday, March 10th. Our topic tonight is Where Do You Find Inspiration? And our guest is Jen Dahl. Uh, my name is Tim Bogatz. I'm a high school teacher from Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm Andrew McCormick, and I'm a middle school teacher. I teach 8th and 9th grade in Cedar Falls, Iowa. And then, Jen, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. I'm Jen Dahl. I am an elementary art teacher in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Well, um, you know, Tim said we wanted to welcome everybody. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a little tricky for me, especially to remember, like, okay, is this episode one or is it episode kind of two? Um, we did a pilot uh, a couple weeks ago, which was really a lot of fun and well-received. Um, and we just want to continue to bring um, some good, lively discussion to you guys. So we're back again, and now we're going to start to get on kind of an every two-week schedule, uh, which will be really exciting. Yep, so we should be uh, joining you the second and fourth Tuesday of every month, and you can watch the AOE live page uh, for the updates, and we'll, we'll always be letting you know when we'll be showing up. Um, before we get started, though, tonight, I want to tell everybody a little bit about uh, kind of the idea for what we're doing with our podcast. Uh, we touched on it a little bit last week, uh, or a few weeks ago, with the pilot episode. And basically what we're trying to do is dig a little deeper with some of the topics that uh, we deal with every day as art educators. And, and a lot of us are feeling really connected uh, with our PLN, everything that we do online. but. A lot of that communication and a lot of that back and forth is very quick, okay? and we don't spend a lot of time going in depth. So we're going to try and do things that are a little bit more substantive uh, and have a little bit more of a, I guess, real discussion about uh, kind of what's going on. So we're going to try and have a little bit more meaningf meaningful talks about what we do every day in our classroom. And we definitely encourage people uh, watching live out there um Chat with us on, on Twitter. Chat with us on the AOE Live portal on Chatroll. Um, we'll do our best to kind of get uh, some feedback and some discussions going. If you have a question for Tim or myself or, or for Jen or you want to chime in. Uh, I know from experience last week it was a little tough sometimes. We had a couple technical difficulties to then also kind of watch the chat roll and see how the feed was going. I'm hoping tonight we, we can streamline that just a little bit more. It's really cool to see kind of everybody um, calling in from all over the country and, and our neighbors to the north up in Canada. It's really excellent. So um, definitely get involved and, and shoot us some questions. Yeah, and then uh, after we're done tonight, uh, Andrew and I will be joined on the chat roll. So if you guys have uh, a little bit more that you want to talk about or continue on the discussion, we'll both uh, be available afterwards. And then uh, the podcast is going to be on the AOE live page, and a little bit later this week it'll go up on iTunes. So you know, whenever you have the time, whether you're driving to school, you're at home in the evening, you know, you have your plan period, you have a chance to listen to this whenever it uh, fits into your schedule. Yeah, that was really cool last week, uh, kind of a couple days later on Twitter to, to see the hashtag AOE live and people saying, you know, I'm listening to this on my drive to work, and it was like a Tuesday or Wednesday, which is really excellent. I know myself, I'm a big consumer of podcasts and, and audio, and uh, that's where I do most of my listening is, you know, prepping in the room, driving, um, cleaning up the house. So definitely uh, check us out on iTunes, um, subscribe, give us a rating, um, give us some reviews. Um, but enough about that. Let's um, really dig in deep tonight to what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk all things inspiration. Um, we want to really break down this conversation because as Tim and I were planning, I, I have a tendency, and, and Tim a little bit, we can kind of go off on these tangents and they get really rich. So we wanted really to focus on uh, lesson plan inspiration. Where do you get inspiration to implement new lessons and run new lessons? Um, two, uh, what inspires your own teaching style, so kind of bigger picture. Um, and then 
The third question, which I'm really kind of enamored with, is what inspires your professional endurance and evolution? And I think about that as both a new teacher who's been at it a year, two years. How do you endure? How do you keep going? Um, and then as a, a more seasoned veteran teacher, how do you evolve and how do you change and how do you stay fresh? So really looking forward to um, that topic or that point. So to help mm -hmm. us tonight, um, Jen's already introduced herself, but elementary art teacher from Black River Falls, Wisconsin, and I met Jen about a year ago and just been enamored with her ever since. And uh, she's excellent. Um, she is the president of the Wisconsin Art Education Association, and I think tonight we'll talk a little bit about pros and cons of joining a, an organization like that. And she is the NAEA Elementary Division Director-Elect. So we've got, like, the goods tonight. We've got the big wig here on our show with us. <laughs> Very cool. Um, yeah, we're, we're excited to have you, Jen, so welcome. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. Cool. Okay, I'll go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, you know, talking inspiration, the first topic, like Andrew talked about, lesson plans. Uh, so, Jen, I'll throw this at you first. Uh, what are some of your favorite places to go for your teaching inspiration, for your lesson inspiration? Uh, you know, are you a Pinterest person? Do you do blogs, other types of literature, anything else? Like, where where do you get your idea? Where do you get your best ideas? Um, I love to read in my classroom, so I often use literature to use with my little kiddos, especially. I used some Pinterest, but I found a lot of Pinterest that they were Pinterest fails for me. They never turn out like they look on Pinterest yep. ever. Yep. I love to follow the blogs of Cassie Steffens, What the Art Teacher Wore, Painted Paper, um, Deep Space Sparkle, and AOE lesson plans always seem to work out well. Uh, and then I know you have your own blog too. Like, what, what do you generally do with your blog? I just update parents and families what we're up to in art class. And it's just kind of a reflection piece for me more than a sharing to the world kind of piece. Um, so that my parents and students know what's going on. Okay. All right, so Andrew, uh, throwing that at you next. Uh, what about you? Where, where are your ideas coming from? Whoa. Well, that, uh, okay, so <laughs> I, I love what Jen said about Pinterest fails. That just cracks me up. There's that website, Pin, Pinstrosity, where people are like, I nailed it, and it just looks awful. Yeah. And it is funny because it's like, you know, sometimes when we have a void of, of ideas, we're like, oh, let's go find this. We don't realize this sort of backstory and evolution and planning and a priori knowledge that the teacher had. So I do that some, uh, but I do, I have kind of ventured away from it. I would say my inspiration comes from I'm just never not thinking about good ideas, and I don't know how do how do I explain that a little bit more. I feel like I'm never not an art teacher, and I don't know that that's the best model to follow. But you know, seven o'clock at night, I'm watching The Voice with my kids, and there might be a TV show or a commercial that comes on that gets me thinking about something else. So. I guess I definitely pull a lot from pop culture and what I know our students, you know, middle school, high school, even elementary kids are are watching and seeing. So I'll pull inspiration from video games, websites, as long as I feel like I can connect it to some art history um, that's maybe got a little bit more substance to it. It's definitely been a good hook for me. So, so Tim, how about you? I mean, right back at you, kind of the same question. Where do you get? You know, I'm kind of the the same way with that. Uh, you know, you really, I don't know, for me, I don't really turn off the, that art teacher mode. And so, you know, you always come up with all sorts of crazy ideas, and you never know when inspiration is going to strike. So, you know, that, that's why I always have, you know, a sketchbook, some kind of a notebook with me. And, you know, like, I got a great lesson plan from, you know, eating ice cream with my kids one night, and I saw something, wrote it down, and turned into a great lesson. So, you know, you never know where that's going to come from. Uh, and like Jen said, there's a lot of great blogs out there that I love to follow. And you know, sometimes that's about lesson planning. Other times, it's just to kind of think uh, and reflect on what you're doing, which you know was another thing that Jen said. Uh, and I think that reflection will sort of lead you to not only new ideas but improving ideas that you already have. I think that's kind of a, a big thing for me. Is you know, I I try not to settle with my lessons. I guess I'm always looking for either new things or ways to make my old things a little bit better. 
Okay, so this is kind of a side question, and Jen, maybe I'll, uh, if, if you want to take this one first. You know, there's those teachers who have the laminated lesson plan that they've been doing for 20 years, and it's like, oh, I love this lesson. Um, I learned, for me, I've always been wary of that. So do you feel like you have kind of a shelf life on your lesson plans where you're just like, that is played out, it's not resonating anymore, or does it kind of depend each lesson in each class? Um, there's a few that I love to do, but if it's a wonderful lesson with one year of kindergartners, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an amazing lesson with another year of kindergartners. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. if you switch it around and you reflect and then you decide, oh, that didn't work at all, or I'm going to try this differently next time. I think it's all about, you know, I always tell my student teachers, you have got to be like Kenny Rogers. You got to know when to hold them, and when to fold them, and when to walk away, and when to run. Because that sometimes is, it yeah. works, and then sometimes it doesn't. If it's Tuesday and it's a full moon, it might not work. <laughs> but it's worked for ten years. Uh, so, do you get a lot of student teachers? I mean, and maybe yeah. that's kind of a segue into. Um, it, does that inspire you? And, and maybe I need to let Tim kind of answer his shelf life question because I'd be interested to hear. The high school perspective on that. Yeah, um, I have exactly two lessons that I do every year. Um, one that I save for my seniors and one for drawing one. Uh, and everything else rotates. Like, I I don't settle. I, I don't know what it is, but it's like, oh, I just taught that last year. I don't need to teach that again. Like, even if it's successful, for whatever reason, I'm always looking for new things. And I don't know if that's just something that you know, keeps me from getting bored, and, you know, there's nothing to say I won't get back to that eventually, like, you know, maybe I taught it in 2011, it worked really well, hey, let's break it back out this year, And but for the most part, my lessons rotate, and I'm always reading, I'm always looking uh, for new things, and always developing new lessons, so, you know, maybe, you know, our, our product could be a little bit better if I just did those tried and true lessons each year, but, you know, I'm going to get bored with that, so... For me, uh, it, it's real quick uh, on and off the shelf. Well, right, and I think it depends every year. I mean, some year each classroom kind of has a different flow, and I know I've had to ditch lessons that I've loved because it just doesn't make sense anymore to do it kind of when the time is, and so we'll ditch that. We'll do something different. Now, I have a kind of a specific example. I have this lesson plan that I... I want to work so badly. It's based off of Egyptian uh, canopic jars, the jars that the used to put like the organs in. So it's a little macabre and gross. Mm -hmm. and, and I've called it pop opic jars because I want the heads of these jars to be figures from pop culture, and the kids would get into it. I feel like I'm 0 for 2 on that thing. I've done it tw two years now, and every time it's like we've got structural issues, conceptual issues. It's just not really resonating. I had a field experience two student, and I was like, I'm going to scrap this one and let you come up with something. And this student, 19, 20 years old, knocked it out of the park, did something that's kind of similar but different and is a thousand times better. And I just told her today, I was like, I'm going to use that lesson now. Like, that's a great lesson. We kind of worked on it together. Um, so I definitely think there's a part of collaboration that breeds um, inspiration for sure. I've okay, also so here's kind of a question that goes with that. Uh, you guys steal lessons from your student teachers? Oh, yeah. Jen, why don't you elaborate on that one? Because you gave me an no, open. Very <laughs> much so, very much so, because I think it's not necessarily stealing. I would say collaborating. Okay. Um, um, but, yes, if it works and if you can get it to work, absolutely I use those kinds of lessons. And also I've tried things like... Um, doing something at kindergarten level and then doing something the same project at fifth grade level, that's cool to watch. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. very cool. And I got to say, I agree with Jen. Like, and maybe there's a bit of a, I, you know, this is the language of PLCs, that notion of tight and loose. Um, with some things I'm very tight and some things I'm very loose. I, I've never let a field experience student um, level one, two, three, do a lesson that's 100% completely, I have no idea what they're doing. I always am involved and I'm talking and it's like, well, what about this? What about this? So I really do feel like by the time they run, you know, quote unquote, their lesson, 
it's really something that we've hashed out together. And that's why I don't feel bad when I say, like, I'm using this now, because it really is more of a collaboration. So how about you, Tim? Do you do kind of the same? Yeah, and, you know, I'm kind of the same way. Like, you know, I... I want to be hands-off with my student teachers, and especially when you've got a good one, you want to kind of let them go. But at the same time, you do need to plan things out a little bit, both, you know, as a benefit to you and to them. And, you know, it's not fair to the students to just kind of let your student teacher attack and, you know, not not kind of know where they're going with things. So it, it's good, good, good to, to, to kind of foresee how students you know, might come and, and just try and plan those things out. And I think it is... Uh, you know, beneficial for everyone to do that, and like you said, I, I have no problem, uh, you know, taking those ideas, run with them. Sometimes we change them, sometimes we do about the same thing. But when you're that involved um, with with the planning, then you know, I I don't have any problem with using those. So I'm I'm just kind of checking at the chat roll, and I've seen we've got a lot of consensus. People kind of saying, you know, they they're always collaborating, they're always kind of recycle. Uh, revamping lessons, ditching ones that don't work, and, and tweaking some more. Um, this is maybe kind of a side tangent, but I think it's important. You know, this is Youth Art Month, um, and this might segue kind of into our next thing about our overall style. Um, what about, you know, like when we do these competitions and we get the kids' artwork out and we see what other schools are doing, does that sort of then inspire us to change our own lessons, look at other people's lessons? How does that sort of, like, that stuff affect our, our work? Jen, do you have an, I, kind of a feeling on that? I know you're really involved with um, YAM. You guys just had it in Wisconsin recently, right? Yes, we did. We just did. And I was super excited because the Winner Winner Chicken Dinner was only a second grader. Oh, that's um, cool. A sergeant art trip. So that was exciting for them because they were just a second grader. Um, those kind of things. I mean, you have, I by the time I have to pick a piece of art for Yam, and I only get to pick three pieces of art, by the time I have to pick, I probably have 20,000 pieces of art ready to go. I mean, that are yep. possible. So, I don't compare those kind of things because that's, that's too big to compare. Because I know that that's their teacher's favorite, and I don't know. I don't always necessarily pick my most favorite, but yeah, a lot goes into that, so I don't know. I don't necessarily. I'm ex I was very excited that it was a little kiddo, um, but I don't necessarily draw that as inspiration. Mm -hmm. How about you guys? Well, um, you know, I think as far as the art shows go, actually I was just glancing at the chat roll, and Sarah Shoemaker uh, said something really good. Uh, she said she tries to get to as many elementary art exhibits as she can. And I think, you know, with the different art shows, whether they're, you know, Youth Art Month related or otherwise, I think it can be kind of a chance to not only see some new lessons, but also collaborate with, you know, other teachers from around your area. Because there have been so many times where I'll be, you know, just kind of walking through the show, another teacher will stop me and be like, hey, I love this lesson. Hey, what did you do for that? And we can kind of talk things through and kind of see how it fit for them. Or I will see, you know, a really cool sculpture, but I'm not quite sure of the process with that. So, you know, I'll send that teacher an email and just say, hey, I really love this. You know, can you give me some tips on how I might be able to do that in my room? So I think, you know, we see those different ideas, and a lot of times that can kind of spark an interest for us or spark an inspiration for things that we can do in our own classroom. And I think you hit it on the head there, Tim. You have to then kind of internalize it. It's like, you know, and I've seen this happen before. It, I think it's rare, but, you know, people will, will go to uh, conference art shows with, you know, all, your, all the schools in the area or YAM or Scholastics and, and maybe see a project and it's like, oh, that's, that's a great one. I want to do that. But they haven't kind of internalized it and made it their own, and it's going to end up like a penstrosity failure, you know, because they didn't put in the legwork to really make it work. So I think you're right. The best thing at going to those shows, you know the teachers that go through the legwork of doing advocacy and promoting their kids' work are really good teachers. And when you get to talking with them and collaborate, that's when you really have good ideas and, and sharing good ideas rather than, again, I think it goes back to sharing versus, like, just stealing. Right? It's like, 
collaborating, getting at the bottom of it versus just appropriating and just grabbing it, and it's just not going to be as good that way. So. so. Yeah, and you know, I think that goes back to something Jen said earlier with. Just, uh, you know, you have to know what works for the classes you have at this moment, you know. And it may look like a great idea in an art show, but then you start thinking about <laughs> it and, you know, you say, I'll try that with my second grade, and you're going to fail miserably. Okay. So, you know, like you said, it, it's worth the time to kind of reflect on your own kids and what they're going to be able to do and what you're going to be able to do with it as the teacher. Mm -hmm. Correct. I do have the luxury of having eight chances to get it right because I have eight sections of classes. So I do have that luxury. Like my kindergartners, I have eight sections so I can see some things in between on the fly. Yeah. Now, here's a question for you, Jen. Do you ever get bored with that? Because, like, when I was teaching elementary art, like, you know, you struggle through through the first two, and then, you know, the next three or four times it goes great. And then by the time you get to the afternoon, like, seriously, I'm doing this again? Like, do you, do you ever get tired of that? And mine I write in a row, and sometimes I have to write myself, like, a little Post-it note to remember to tell those last groups everything because I felt yeah. like I already told them. Yep. So I have to do a public service announcement in the middle of the class and be like, oh, I forgot to tell you this important part. Yeah. So it depends. Yeah, I, that's cool. Hey, so um, kind of moving on, but, but kind of circling back to something we, we discussed earlier. If, you know, you're teaching lessons and they're not going well, okay, and overall, like, you're not happy with the way your teaching is going, okay, where do you go... Uh, to learn or to think about what to do differently. So, like, Jen, what's your process? If you need to change things up, how do you go about that? If I have time to reflect and think about it, it might be mostly to have to do with my organization of it or my presentation of it. So I'll work on that if I have time. But sometimes I have back-to-back -back classes. I don't have that luxury most of the time. And if it didn't work... I'm okay with scrapping it all together and just pulling out something new in that in-between section just so it's successful for my kids because it's not about me and how successful I look, it's about them and that right. they're getting the objectives and the learning targets that I want them to get and I think that's part of being a great art teacher is knowing when to fold them. Yep, yep. Yeah, and sometimes you've got to be honest. Yeah. Um, so Andrew, what about you? Like when when it's time to reflect, what what do you do? Where do you go? Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I'm kind of picking up on from what Jen said, and also what I feel is sometimes it's time is kind of the the enemy of of reflecting and then really kind of evaluating whether it's good or not. I love the point that she made that it's not about you looking good and making what I would call mommy pleasers things that can go home. It's about yeah. what are the kids learning. Um, exactly. And, and, you know, this even came up on our, our talk last week about classroom management, you know, that one of the first steps is to not take things so personally. So if things aren't going well, you're not a horrible teacher. You're, you don't need to, like, walk, fold it up and, and totally walk away. Maybe that project just didn't work. And to be honest with it, um, and one of the things that I've started doing that I think has really been beneficial is I'll just tell my kids. I'll be like, hey, you know it. I know it. That one didn't work out like I thought I wanted to. Here's why I think it didn't work. And if I'm going to do this again next semester or next year, here's what I'm going to do different. And I think that sort of behind the curtain look at at evaluating success and learning is really good for the kids to see and take part in. Um, you know, but I, I think that's the short game. The, the short game is reflecting and what's working on a week to week basis. I think there's the long game, which is like how connected are we to PLNs, to professional organizations? What are we doing that enriches us outside of the grind of eight to three, you know, nine months a year? What are we doing that keeps feeding our passion? And, and I guess kind of builds up that notion of endurance. So I think later on in the show we can talk about what can you do to build that endurance and keep building because that I think is the long game. 
So, so Tim, how about you? Same question. Like, you know, how? Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot to to chew on there, and I think we need to get back to that point in just a second. Yeah. But yeah, you just taking the time to reflect, and you know, a lot of people that I've told this to find this really weird. But I spend like, I don't want to say a significant, but part of my plan time almost every day just thinking, you know, and that may be thinking about new lessons that may be you know, reflecting on what's gone well, what's gone, you know, not so well, and I, you know, think the other kids in the classroom are just like, who's that weird guy sitting at his desk doing nothing? But, you know, that, that's the time when I really try to kind of reflect on what, what has happened and, you know, what I can do better, and if I need to extend that a little bit further, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll write about that. Like my personal blog, you know, I spend a lot of time reflecting with that, and, you know, I just had a lesson fail really miserably last week. I tried to combine two of my lessons uh, into one, and it it was an utter disaster. And, you know, I think in order to get all those thoughts in order, I'm going to have to write things down. And so I'll probably have a blog post coming uh, fairly soon that just kind of reflects on why did this go so badly? What do I need to change up? And like you said, it's just a matter of kind of finding that time the, that you need to reflect on those things. And I think, and Jen, maybe I, I'm going to say a kind of general thought about, you know, secondary versus elementary and chime in if you think I'm wrong. There was a really great point on chat roll by, I'm sorry, I'd give you a shout out, but it said guest about, you know, if something's not going well, collaborate with your kids. Talk to them about what they can do, what I can do to make it better. Is that tougher to do at the elementary level where you see them more infrequently and you're really kind of trying to get lessons done in one or two days so you don't have that month-long project? You know, high school and junior high, we have the luxury of seeing them mostly every day so you can kind of tinker with some things, and it might be tougher with elementary to do that. Is that a fair assessment? Um, it depends on the lesson, and I do look at my students and I value their opinion and and they're my learners, and if they're looking at me with blank stares, I know that I have to start over, re-explain in a different way, or I have them regather if it's too many directions at one time, and regather or do a public service announcement if I forgot part of what I needed to say to them. I also have a visual chart in the front of my classroom so that my students can see the steps if they weren't listening to said steps and watching them from before. So yeah. I try a whole bunch of different strategies to make sure that they're successful learners, but I'm willing to admit if it doesn't work and we try to work it out together, even if they're in kindergarten or fifth grade. Yeah. So getting back to kind of the big broad topic of like what influences our teaching style, um, specifics, Jen, did you have some places that you go to maybe cr like still, um, and I know you kind of answered this with some of the things, but even early on did you have some places that you think were really beneficial that influenced your style that kind of made you the teacher you are? Um, I always love to read books that connect to my lessons, so that was one of my early discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, each year in my school district, we host an art idea exchange, which is kind of cool. Even in the age of Pinterest, we get together one Saturday morning, and then we have lunch together, and we each share a lesson and the whole work up behind it. And this year, we had about 20 participants, and it's just fun to see K-12, all the different examples of what they do in real life person when you can ask them those questions. I always love, 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 love that Saturday. And this is our 31st annual, so we've been doing it for a long, long time. That's excellent. Uh, Tim, do you have some go-to places either currently um, or things early on that kind of informed you in your style? Um, I don't know that I necessarily have, like, go-to things. Just kind of the the world around me, honestly. Just I spend a lot of time thinking, observing, and that's where most of my lessons come from. Uh, there are a lot of great ideas out there, uh, you know, just from different blogs that you know I I love to read, books that I love to read, um, and art history is a big thing for me too. You know, just different artists, um, mostly modern for me, but just kind of the subjects that they tackle and the ideas that they're 
they're reaching out toward. You know, I try and sort of alter those, change those uh, to sort of fit the high school level. And so, you know, a lot of things that interest me uh, that I think will also interest my students, okay, those will kind of turn into lessons. So it's just a lot of, you know, my everyday reading, looking, observing, uh, and that's kind of what what keeps me going as far as, as the lessons go. Well, and I think we can kind of break the this answer. I didn't think of this before, almost into two different realms. There's kind of like the digital spaces. Where do we go as far as Twitter, PLN, um, blogs, websites? Um, and, you know, I can give some specifics. Like there's that giant um, Facebook group called Art Teachers, which is like 7,000 people. And, and I like that group, but sometimes I feel like it's um, – a good example of like there's almost too much sometimes it's hard to filter out like the good stuff yep. the bad stuff and the stuff I shouldn't say bad stuff but just like the stuff that'll really resonate with me and that I'll find useful versus stuff that just kinda becomes noise um, I've recently joined a couple different Facebook groups that are smaller and kind of micro level interests one is called design educators which is like 150 200 people and another one called um, Secondary photography teachers. I mean, very specific, and that's been also really beneficial. But then I think there's this other side, which is the physical. Where do we physically, literally go face to face to connect with people? And that's where I think Jen's um, being such a great advocate of the national organization and the state organization. You know, I think about where I'm at in my profession, and I, I know for a fact that so much of it is because of. I got involved with Iowa Art Educators early on, met wonderful people, said yes to things, opened myself up to opportunities, and, and that's just really been a, a great boon for me. Yeah. So, Jen, can you talk a little bit about, you know, like your involvement with professional organizations and the benefits that you see? Um, I love being a volunteer for something that I love dearly and to be able to be a leader of something that is so very important to me to provide advocacy to the entire state. Um, we just finished up with YAM like Andrew said before and that's a huge adv advocacy tool for our entire state. Um, I love attending leadership meetings and those kinds of opportunities just to see how I can foster leaders and how my kids can foster leading in art um, because we're not just that special class. We are an important part of our school and we're often forgot about. So I love that I can have this volunteer job that's very important. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and if I can just talk for a minute about kind of my experience, you know, uh, it took me eight or nine years to actually join my state professional organization. And once I did, I spent all my time saying, why wasn't I doing this before? Uh, and it's just been a great experience for me to be able to connect with those other teachers, whether it be through just local workshops or state conferences or anything else. And, you know, I'm headed to uh, the national conference for the first time uh, in a couple weeks here and I could not be more excited about it. I feel like there's just so much out there as far as interaction with people and some of the advocacy points and just everybody learning and growing together I think it's a really great thing. So Jen before we let you go and give you kind of the lightning round I, I have a very selfish question for you something that I feel like I've kind of struggled with I feel like my statewide professional organization has been so beneficial for me and I want it to be beneficial for everyone. I want to see it spread and, and more teachers involved. What do you do or do you have some tactics or, or ideas for people who, who know what's out there, know what it is and willingly just no thanks, don't want to do it? Because I do feel like I kind of encounter that and I, sometimes I get a little frustrated. So hit me with your best tips to get those people on board. I think talking to them, making that connection helps. Um, we in Wisconsin, if you come to our state conference, we have a different price for members and non-members. And I really, and then we um, include that price with making them into members, which is a great benefit for them and for us because they get those extra tools 
and you know, um, I just really put myself out there to make sure that they know that I'm an advocate for them. I will write a letter to their school board if they need me. I will share my lessons. You can email me on Monday and ask me what I'm teaching that day, and I feel like those are things that I would always do for any member of our organization, especially in Wisconsin. It's been a tough few years in Wisconsin as a teacher, as an art teacher. So I think it's even more important for us to be banded together and to make sure that we are the strong go-to place for our teachers. Yeah. So well, I don't know that I have any really well, like bullet points, but but see, I set you, I set you yeah. up because as soon as I ask that, I know that there's no such thing as a silver bullet. It's like because if there was, it would already be out there. It's it's kind of like the silver shotgun slug. You have to kind of provide lots of different, you know, BBs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what you said about advocacy and you know people need to know that it's worth it to them. So you know you've got to prove that when you join this organization, there is some benefit and. You know, I think it just takes time to to convince people that are kind of set. And you know, I've done it so many years without it. I don't need to do it. Maybe I should chat up Tim about it because he was kind of one of those stalwarts for a while. He didn't want to do it, and then he came around. So. And that's what I always recommend to my student teachers: is to become a member right away. It seems like a big, expensive piece, but. Um, in Wisconsin, all the educator effectiveness, I don't know if you guys in Nebraska and Iowa have to do educator effectiveness, but we have to do a ton of educator effectiveness, and um, I really am trying to improve the professional development that we have as part of that. So I gave um, different presentations at the conference about those kinds of things because that's, you know, one of those heartbeats that's happening right here, right now, that teachers want to know about. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh. All right, so Jen, um, before we let you go, uh, we always do a lightning round with our guests. Okay. So we've got three questions coming at you, real quick questions and real quick answers. So I'm going to start out. Uh, it's a two-parter. What do you do best in your classroom as you're teaching, and what is something that you're striving to do a little bit better? I think I am the best at having fun and taking it um, just how it is because it doesn't always work. Um, and I think that I am always striving to be more organized, but who isn't? Mm -hmm. So, Jen, do you have a uh, least favorite artist and a artist that you really think is kind of overrated and not that great to teach? A least favorite and an overrated one? No, most favorite and then least favorite. Most favorite. Oh, okay. Most favorite, I would say Chuck Close, because if you were dealt those things that Chuck was dealt, I would give up. He never gave up, and I tell the kids that when we read about him. Um, I would give up. I don't like Rothko or bacon. Mm. Oh, I like bacon. Uh, yeah. Francis Bacon, and and I like real bacon too. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I I like it when people disagree, so that's good. I, I won't hold that against you, Jen. <laughs> I was gonna say you shouldn't be yelling at our guests. Like, there's no wrong answers here, Andrew. I know, I know. I'm, I'm feisting. Sorry. All right. So, uh, third final question. Uh, we talked about changing lessons, changing ideas. Um, but Jen, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to change? What keeps people from from changing up what they do? That fear of not being perfect, not being the best. You know what I mean? You're gonna make mistakes. Yep. You're still yep. human. Even if you are um, the state president like I am, I make mistakes all the time. Yeah. So I think you've got to just, you know, the grass is not greener on the other side. Everybody makes mistakes, and it's okay. And the kids make mistakes, and it's good for the kids to see that you make mistakes. Very true. Cool. All right. Well, Jen, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate everything you had to say, all of your insight. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again soon. Awesome, thank you. Bye, Jen. Bye. Oh man. All right, so Andrew. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, big takeaways there. What What do you think? Um, 
Well, you know, some of the stuff, we, you know, we've kind of come out uh, and, and talked about, but there's just so much good stuff. And my big takeaway keeps being that everything's really connected. You know, you're, you're, how, you're, how you're connected with people, how you're honest with kids, being open to failure. But I would say for me, you know, the lesson plan inspiration question, the, what I want to stress again is like it's, it's about the kids, right? Like so you might have a wonderful idea, but if you don't think that that resonates with your kids, tough luck. Like you shouldn't do it because you should be focused on doing lesson plans and, and, and teaching things that you know are going to be great for the kids. So that's actually I think kind of uh, ground zero for me on my inspiration is what are the kids into and what can I craft that I know will pique their interest. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and you know, one other point I kind of wanted to get to, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, just visiting those art shows, talking to other teachers about, you know, what they do and how they do it. And I feel like so many teachers are too proud to ask for help or too afraid, like Jen said, of failing at things. And you got to let that attitude go. I mean, you need to you know, try new things that, like you said, are going to interest your kids. You know, ask for help from people who have done it before so you're able to be successful with it. And even if you're not successful, let your kids, you know, see you fail. Let them see how you work through that because you're going to be better off for it. They're going to be better off for it. And so I think the, the big thing is, you know, you, you can't be too proud. Like, don't, you can't make everything perfect and you shouldn't try. And, and, you know, that goes back to your own style and your own lesson plans being based upon who you, who you associate with, your, your PLC, but even broader than that is PLNs. And, and that's why I love the, the kind of digital age that we live in. I can collaborate with people and ask questions of people from around the world, which is just really excellent. So um, that's been, I think, a really big uh, benefit to teachers nowadays. And, and also, I think, when it comes to your style, and this came out with Jen, don't hamper yourself. Uh, green light your own ideas. It's okay to fail. Um, I made a decision a couple years ago to just, before I started listing all the reasons why I couldn't do a new project or do a new initiative or offer a new class, I'm just going to green light that idea and see where it takes me. Um, and that's been excellent for me. Yeah, I think I think that's good, and you know I'm kind of the same way. Um, and I don't know, I've noticed for for better or for worse that you know my classroom, especially with those kids that I've taught for two and three years, really starts to kind of take on my personality. And so if you're a little more relaxed about that and willing to just try ideas that you don't know where they're going. Okay, your kids are going to pick up on that, and they're going to do the same. And I think that's an important thing, you know, for an art. Like we're we're trying to develop artists here, and you know, you need to let them kind of work through their ideas like that, and they need to see you working through mm -hmm. the ideas like that. So, you know, for me, uh, I try and let that show through, kind of with my personality. You know, that it's okay to fail, it's okay to work through some things, it's okay to not know what the end goal is. And I think that's helpful for, for our kids to see that. No, um, but like, what about you? Like, does your personality play kind of a role in you know not only how you try lessons, but but also kind of how you teach? Oh, uh, f for sure. And I was just thinking, you know, that's you know, I've always been a little do uh, suspicious, I should say, of of when that happens when you've been with a student for you know a group of students for a long time that they start to become little mini-yous and, and they have your interests. Um, that's why I think it's been so nice that I've taught both the jobs that I've had have always been in a department where there's at least two people. So there's not this over-reliance on the one personality, the one art teacher, the one go-to person. Um, but definitely, I mean, that's, that's what makes us who we are is that my personality comes out. And, you know, we talked a little bit about um, field experience students, student teachers, one of the things I always caution them about is, you see how I do this. This works for me, and it might work for you, but you might also want to take a dash of this person and a dash of that person and really become an amalgamation of all these different influences. Right. Uh, because I know I, I have sort of a zany, off-the-wall, nervous 
energy. I just do because I'm always kind of a little worried that things aren't going to go well. And because of that, I think I overcompensate and I'm big and I'm goofy and I'm fun. And that's yeah. not everybody. Uh, but it, it's kind of what I fell into when I first started teaching and I saw it work for me. And I've kind of gone with it and, and I've, and I've uh, run with that to the point now that sometimes I'll even deliberately kind of under plan new lesson plans and units okay. because I don't want them to seem too polished because then it becomes just this like rote thing. I want there to be a little spontaneity and a little like energy in the room. So that's definitely not something that I can say works for everybody, but it definitely works for me. Yeah, true. That's cool. And you know, I think kind of an important point with that, I guess with both of us there is just, you know, we have been able to kind of reflect on what we do and kind of help our teaching style through that reflection. And I guess, you know, I would encourage most teachers to do that, whether they're student teachers, regular teachers, whatever. I think it's important to kind of reflect on your teaching style because, you know, once you start reflecting, you see where your influences are kind of coming from. And once you see where they're coming from, you can kind of direct where they're going to be going. And once you kind of get that vision of, you know, here's who I am as a teacher, here's what I want to accomplish, here's how I can do that best. You know, that's going to keep you growing, that's going to keep you evolving. And for me, that's, you know, a big part of kind of staying excited and staying refreshed, like we talked about earlier, uh, about, you know, everything we do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just think that's what leads to that, you know, the, the endurance and the evolution, you know, is, is keeping it fresh and staying connected. So, yeah, really good points. All right, cool. All right, so uh, any closing thoughts before we wrap this up? Um, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, green light those ideas, stay true to yourself, and surround yourself with quality people. That's kind of my shotgun list of what I, how I would make sure that you, you find good inspiration and you stay inspired and, and be the type of teacher you want to be. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I think, you know, you need to, like I said, reflect, figure out where your style come from, comes from and where you want it to go. And I think that's what's going to keep things fresh and, and keep things working for you. So uh, we'll go ahead and close shop down. So a big thank you to uh, Jen Dahl for joining us tonight. A uh, reminder that once we're done, the podcast is going to be available on the AOE Live page. And in a couple days, it'll be on iTunes. Uh, you can listen to it as you're driving to work, when you're at home in the evening, during your plan time, whenever works for your schedule. Yeah, make sure to hit up Twitter uh, uh, and check the hashtag AOE Live. Um, I'm definitely going to hang around for a little bit and get a little bit more uh, responsive on chat roll. Sometimes it's a little tricky as I'm listening to all these great things that I, I feel like I don't get as involved with chat roll as I'd like. So I'll, we'll, we'll kind of be hanging around, and, and if there's some questions that people want to ask kind of afterwards, um, that would be really excellent. All right. Good point. So we will both be there. Uh, and to close it out, I am Tim Bogat. And on behalf of Andrew McCormick, uh, thank you for joining us tonight on AOE Live. All right. Bye, everybody.